Welcome back, uh, Tencid Nor Campbell, returning to the set here. Uh, thank you for being patient with us as we dealt with some uh, sound difficulties and hopefully everything is taken care of so that you can enjoy the rest of our conversations. You know, the patient's voice is important. And for this segment, we have with us Dr. Vinicius Dominguez. And he's a rheumatologist originally from Brazil and uh, trained in New York and practicing in, in Florida. Florida. Yes. Okay, so I have, um, is there anything else that you want to let the audience know about you? No, I've been working with Creaky Joints and Global Healthy Living Foundation for about seven years now. I know Seth Ginsburg and Louis Tarr for some quite time. And it's very enjoyable working with these people, very patient advocates. It's, it's something that I'm proud of doing. And we are so proud to have them do that too. Yes, okay. So um, the first thing that I wanted to ask you about is the, what do you see as the major differences um, between like treatment and stuff in, in Brazil, like treatment and, and take diagnosis to treatment times and um, you know, how it looks in terms of the diagnosis and treatment between there and the United States and maybe even from Florida to New York because sure. that's different places get different kind of treatment. Of course, so I think uh, rheumatology has uh, seen a complete revolutionize in care in the past 15 years with the era of the biologics, right? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, Brazil is lagging a little bit there, so the access to biologics is uh, still suboptimal, right? This okay. is a dr dramatic difference what I see here in the States. Thankfully here, people have access early on Concomitantly, a couple of the serologic tests for specifically rheumatoid arthritis, such as rheumatoid factor, and now the anti-CCP, citric succinylated peptide. Oh, wait a minute, wait. anti-CCP. Citric, yeah, it's the other name, citric succinylated peptide. Okay, or that's for the patient audience. Yeah, exactly, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Those are assays that are slightly expensive in Brazil too, so time to diagnosis in Brazil is longer, and okay. effective therapy sometimes especially with the biologics, can take longer than in the United States. That's the main difference. Okay. As far as clinicians go, rheumatologists in Brazil are perfectly trained and there's no lag in knowledge whatsoever. Do they have enough? They do, yes. Okay. Yeah, we well, do. that's and the, something we don't always have. It's the same disparity as we have in the United States, oh, okay. big cities, there's a concentration of MDs, and when you go to the rural areas, there's also lack of MDs. Okay. It's not dramatically different from here. But I, I, if I could point out the big difference, I think it's the access to the most expensive drugs, such as biologics and the small molecules now. Hmm. Yeah, those biologics. Okay, so why don't we explain to the difference, explain to our patient viewers um, the, the difference between um, physical damage and the need for biologics versus the you know, the um, disease activity and the need for the biologics, just some sure. of that. Yeah, so again, 15 years with the revolution of biologics and the FDA regulatory issues, there have been a huge shift from metrics, right? Now we have metrics to gauge disease activity. So for rheumatoid arthritis, we have the DAS28, the CDI, and a lot of disease metrics to figure out who's active and who's inactive. Initially, these were done mainly for clinical trials. So we have the ACR20, which is a 20% response to therapy, ACR50, which is 50% in, in, uh, improvement. In clinical practice, we use this to gauge the patients who have active disease versus inactive disease. This actually does not translate in patients feeling good or bad. I was gonna say, so is this test, this is why they collect our blood all the time, well, right? M mainly not, this is mainly clinical exam, how many okay. tender and swollen joints you have, ah. and most of them have a composite with blood, which I, either is EESR, mm -hmm. um, the sedimentation rate, or the CRP, C-reactive protein. Okay. But, and it's very important for us uh, to make the distinction between joint damage and joint activity, right? Yes. Because when you have activity, the indices, the C die, the DAS28, they will be very high. And at that point, it's um, pertinent to increase therapy. Okay. At that point, you do triple therapy, you do biologics, you do small molecules. At that point, you have an inflamed joint that will react to treatment. We, we, we can act upon that joint. 
a lot of times, unfortunately, if there is long-term damage, the, the, you, you do have joint pain, but there's not in, a lot of inflammation. The joint space is already narrowed, right? It's bone to bone or are some different uh, manifestations. There's no specific rheumatoid arthritis inflammation. It's mainly damage. And at that point, if you increase, if you step up therapy, you may actually cause harm and not cause any good. At that point, there has to be a dialogue between the doctor and the patient to explore other options. Okay, if I'm getting this right, I'm, I'm gonna just take myself as an example, right? So when I go in and they wanna look at my joints and they say, oh, well, you're not swollen and you know things aren't looking bad, but I can feel so much pain in my hands mm -hmm. and I explain that, how does that show up in my treatment? Exactly. This is a, a big difference that sometimes the perception between the doctor and the patient is a little bit different. And unfortunately, we don't have very good tools to gauge that, right? Okay. We, we go by very specific objective measures, and they are suboptimal, unfortunately. Okay. Right? We go for tender, swollen joint count and for inflammation and blood markers. That's when a very important relationship between the doctor and the patient is needed where we, we it has to be a trust relationship, right? A lot of patients actually do feel when they are more inflamed. And um, as you are experienced with the disease, you can probably gauge when your disease is more active or not. A lot of times it's obvious to us, mm -hmm. but when, when it's not, then your feedback is very important and we have to work together to try to gauge the next steps. Okay, and then if, if we're doing something like um recommending physical therapy exactly okay so if physical therapy is given to somebody you know pre knee surgery mm -hmm. right in order to determine whether they need knee surgery mm -hmm. um, does the, um, the the treatment if you, you know like so for me I had osteoarthritis before right and so everything was disintegrating before I had the rheumatoid diagnosis mm -hmm. yeah. so what would be that treat like what what does that treatment program look like for someone like if they started off with one because a lot of people have osteo and, and don't even know that they have rheumatoid exactly yeah that's uh, that's very challenging unfortunately to 2017 we don't have phenomenal approved treatments for osteoarthritis. Say Dr. Kren and Dr. Yazichi, who I can see now, will talk right. about that a little bit. Okay. But currently we have intraarticular steroids and non-steroidal anti-inflammatories for osteoarthritis. The conundrum, the problem is that if you do have rheumatoid arthritis, you develop earlier osteoarthritis, right? Because the inflammation surrounding the joint will uh, end up with joint space narrowing because the definition of osteoarthritis is pretty much joint space narrowing. You have bone and bone and in the middle there's cartilage but as we age or as there's trauma, the cartilage thins out and there's bone to bone. That's the basic concept of it, right? So through time, uh, if you have a lot of inflammation, this process gets accelerated, right? So rheumatoid arthritis patients will eventually develop osteoarthritis earlier. The perspective, and we're very hopeful with data that probably Dr. Yazichi will talk, that there are some new molecules being studied in osteoarthritis that will deliver better uh, options for the future. But as of now, we don't have fantastic treatment. We have NSAIDs, we have steroids, we have some joint supplementation such as glucosamine and so forth. And eventually for bigger joints such as the shoulder, hip, and knee, we're looking unfortunately for a replacement, right? Right. And the techniques nowadays are very uh, good. People have, most of them have good outcomes. But it's very important too, if you do have rheumatoid arthritis and you go through the joint replacement that you, most research done by Susan Goodman now, shows that you should keep most of the medications. The biologics, you should stop for a period of time. Mm -hmm. Methotrexate, probably not. Hydroxychloroquine, probably not. But this is some research that has been done in the last two years, and it's very strong data supporting uh, wrong uh, 
in the past, orthopedic surgeons were very strongly supporting stopping the meds, but if you stop your meds, you have a flare right. post-surgery, and you cannot engage into physical therapy, and long-term outcome is worse. That's the base, the bottom line. One of the things that <coughs> I think we were talking about before we were on camera was like someone like me who has had the replacement but has not been able to get back into uh, full activity, let alone half of the full activity that we were that we were on before. What what would we suggest being a way to deal with that? Yeah, this is a very important question, and again, uh, expectations should have uh, and need to be discussed prior to any surgical procedure and to any uh, treatment option is contemplated. Most patients have very good response to uh, to joint replacements, mm -hmm. but the reality is that you have to do physical therapy, you have to do some uh, non-aerobic, non-impacts like swimming and those things to strengthen the muscles around the joint. A lot of people do not go back to where we, they were before, unfortunately. But with the new techniques and physical therapy and strengthening of the muscles, the hope is that people will have the best outcome possible. So it's not uncommon for people to not be able to go back to exactly. their activities. Mm -hmm. um, what about the possibilities of remission? Like, I want to be in remission. I want to, I really, really, really want to be in remission because I want to be able to do what I could do before. Sure. I want to be able to at least walk a 5K, mm -hmm. let alone run a 5K. Um, and I still, and I can't do that. And it's, it's been two years. Um, what are your suggestions for getting there? What I try to talk to my patients a lot is we have as a group, talk and make a big distinction between what is your pain coming from? Is it predominantly rheumatoid arthritis or is osteoarthritis? Okay. Because our, our momentarian for rheumatoid arthritis is very big. We have really great options for rheumatoid arthritis as opposed to osteoarthritis, right? Okay. So this distinction, I, I make it very clear and I try to educate my patients to really, because the pattern of pains are very different. One is inflammatory, worse in the morning, better with movement. The other one is non-inflammatory, um, has morning stiffness for less than an hour, and is worse with movement, right? So those distinctions need to be made because the, treatments, the treatment modality is very different. That's number one. And number two is... Uh, Wait a minute, before you go to the next piece of that, yeah. I'm one of those people who is fine in the morning, basically, <clears throat> but as the day goes on, yeah. two or three o'clock in the afternoon until bed and then sometimes overnight mm -hmm. is when I have my worst periods of the day. Yeah. So where do people like me fit into that kind of treatment? Yeah, I think it's more towards uh, osteoarthritis picture. Oh, right? okay. You may, you may and you probably do have rheumatoid arthritis, but that part, hopefully and probably is being well controlled. What you're displaying more now is symptoms of wear and tear sort of arthritis, which is the osteoarthritic okay. part of it. Okay. So it's important to make that distinction because again, the treatment modality differs and um, our, our momentarium of medications for osteoarthritis is limited yet. Unfortunately, it's still limited. The hope is that in the next five years, we'll have great treatment. Hmm. Okay, so that's a little frustrating, it but is. Um, well, yeah, because for me, I get like I get my chest flares in the in the night. It's mm -hmm. not even my knees; it's my chest or it's my arms and hands, and I might not have been doing anything. Mm -hmm. But when we start talking about things like, well, this is what we've got for the norm. Do we ever, or does uh, rheumatology ever make room for the patients that are having different experiences? Mm -hmm. Um, and where does that show up in the treatment? <clears throat> yeah, that's when individualized patient care needs to be really um, made part of it, right? Okay. That's what, again, I can't stress it enough, that's why a very good patient-doctor relationship, it's pivotal here, right? A lot of people um, have concomitant fibromyalgia, that it's a complete separate entity uh, right. that has, it's very challenging to treat also, right? There's no blood marker yet. 
there's physical exam is limited so it's a lot of patient reported symptoms and they do exist it's a true disease right, right. it's just very challenging for both the patient and the doctor to really address and for fibromyalgia we have three FDA approved medications and it's very common for those uh, diseases to overlap right that's right. the reality and um, my experience which is not very big hence since my <laughs> I don't even have gray hair but <laughs> what I can say is a lot of times it's a lot of trial and error right okay. there's no single formula out there right it's a lot of adding medication tr trying individual medications to try to get to a a cocktail and um, for fibromyalgia, Tai Chi, stretching, and a lot of those things add to treatment. Okay. So it's a multifactorial thing. All right. And then I interrupted you to talk about that. There was a second piece to it. Do you remember what you were going to say? Not really. Okay, it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we talked a little bit about um, accelerated osteoarthritic disease activity because of the long term RA. And I've talked a little bit about um, what that treatment or the differences in treatment. Um, is there anything that you would like to say to patients in terms of what it's important to talk with their physician sure. about on that yeah. side? Yeah, I think it's very important for the patient to understand the patterns of pain and to report that to their physician, right? It's not, it's try to characterize their pain as pivotal. Morning how long does it last? Does it improve with movement? Does it exacerbate with movement? What are the joints? Is it symmetric? Both sides, obviously as we age, and there's a huge obesity epidemic in the United States, knees are very um, uh, frequently exacerbated okay. with walking with osteoarthritis, right? Which is dramatically different from hand rheumatoid arthritis. So patterns of recognitions are very important. Okay. Um, one last thing before we uh, wrap this session up. Have you had patients that use the Arthritis Power app yes. with you? And mm -hmm. then, and how has that improved your communication? It's, very, it's a very powerful tool to keep the diary of their pain, okay. to understand a lot of patients underestimate their pain. And then when they look back, when they come to the visit and they look back and they see, oh, I've been doing well, and then they open the app and they say, oh, actually, well, I, I score a lot of six here. So maybe I was not doing that well, right? So I figure it's an underutilized tool, but it's a tremendously powerful tool that hopefully we've been incorporating and spreading the seed as, and people have been using more and more. I think it's gonna be, it, and it's, it's, it is already changing the landscape of arthritis research. Oh, thanks to Creepy great. Joints and Global Healthy Living Foundation. All right, Dr. Dominguez, thank you very much thank for joining much us for today. We're going to be wrapping this up for now, and we'll go on a little two-minute break, so you'll see, um, I guess, a slate of something or other on the computer or your phone screen. And so we'll be back then. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.